All right, welcome to part three of my examination of Carl Bau's series, uh, Creation in the 21st Century. Uh, this episode features uh, uh, Floyd Nolan Jones, or Dr. Floyd Nolan Jones, um, and is entitled, and the gynecologist exclaimed, that's the largest vagina I've ever seen. I've ever seen. I've ever seen. Oh, wait, no. The gaps are enormous. All right, I apologize for that. Uh, let's get started. Oh, isn't that a major problem for yes. the hypothesis of evolution? Yes. Do you agree with me that evolution, once we know all the data, and I'm in favor of evolution being taught in the public school system with its strengths and weaknesses, the only strength of evolution is that major professors teach it and hold to it as a philosophic tenet. So, uh, now this is exactly one of the main flaws with this whole equal time concept. I mean, there's a lot of flaws with it, but this is one of those flaws that, that I find um, it to be really illuminating. So equal time, let's give equal time to creation and evolution. Let's teach them both and let the kids figure it out, right? But as Carl Bau says, let's tell the kids the strengths and weaknesses of the theory of evolution. What are the, what are the well, he talks about the weaknesses a lot. What are the strengths of evolution? Oh, that scientists teach it. Its only strength is that scientists teach it. So, picture your picture your children in a classroom, and teacher says we're going to present two ideas about the origins of life and diversity of life on Earth. Uh, one is the theory of creation, which is supported by the Holy Bible and is the Word of God, and this is what God tells you is true. And here's the other theory, the theory of evolution, which. The only reason, the only evidence for it, is that scientists say it's true, and that's its only supporting evidence. Do you see that the flaw with that? And whenever you see this equal time thing taught, don't think for a second that the theory of evolution is being taught in any kind of modern understa any kind of uh, modern understanding of the theory at all okay what they're doing is they're teaching creationism or they're teaching intelligent design and then they're teaching a completely gutted straw man version of evolution that sounds like bullshit to the most ignorant people around and that's what they're teaching that's what equal time means and Carl Bau just goes to prove it right here absolutely and he patted himself on the back when he called it a theory Yes, he did. As the, you pointed out at the beginning. It's just a hypothesis. That's a guess. Yes. Theory deserves some merit and some field and laboratory experimentation. And, of course, it's taught as fact or a law today, the law of Evolution. uh, evolutionary development. And, and that's very tragic. All right. Way to go. Almost chair of the Department of Paleontology of the University of Missouri. Don't know the first thing about the scientific method, apparently. Um, I, I believe it was uh, Richard Dawkins who made the claim. He may have been paraphrasing somebody else. I'm not positive about that. Um, but the statement holds no matter what. That the theory of evolution, in all, in all of the body of scientific theories, no theory has ever been questioned more rigorously, tested more thoroughly than the theory of evolution. Um, no theory. No other theory has been critically examined by scientists performing experiments in an attempt to disprove it in full, or at least its tenets or basic some of its assumptions. No theory has ever been put through that rigorous of treatment, and yet to this day there is not one piece of evidence against it. So, to make the claim, first of all, that again that hypothesis turn into theories is is a load of crap. Um, theories generate hypotheses that can then be tested against the theory, okay? A hypothesis is a paired, a series of paired statements. If this theory is correct, then X is going to happen in the presence of Y. And then you test it. And if it doesn't happen, then it, your theory is called into question. That's, if you reject one of your hypotheses, that's a supporting tenet of your theory. That's a prediction your theory makes. Uh, and a he just doesn't get it, and there's no law of evolution. There's simply it, it's the theory of evolution. It will always be the theory of evolution. Okay, um, if we invent a time machine and we can go back through time and we can watch lizards climb up onto land and grow fur and swing from the trees and live on the plains and become modern humans in a, some time lapse version of things, no, beyond every shadow of a doubt, that humans evolved from simple life forms. 
evolution would still be the theory of evolution. It, that would not change. Now, the audience needs to know that there will be some terms used. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid of these terms. These are the standard terms to let you know that Dr. Jones understands what he's talking about, is familiar with the technical literature, but the point he's going to make is that this living system could not have developed into the progressive living system as the evolutionary community postulates and now asserts. Now, don't be afraid of those big words now, people, okay? He's only using big words because we scientists only use big words just to show you guys that we know what we're talking about, okay? That, that we've read the literature. Um, okay, first, I, as we're going to get into this, when we get into the substance of this, uh, I'm not entirely sure. Yes, he uses the words, but I don't know that he knows what any of them actually mean. At least he doesn't demonstrate it in this talk. Carl, I'd like, as you pointed out, the name of the program is... The gaps are enormous, and that's what we want to show the audience. <laughs> Back when I was at the university and was being trained in the discipline of geology and a subtitle under it, paleontology, um, they told us the gaps were there. <laughs> and every now and then they would show us fossils where we could mm -hmm. see a gap, but no one really elaborated on it. It was glossed over. Yes. And what I want the audience to see is we, we have several examples. Um, all the gaps are not as large. <laughs> I want to show them a, a good grouping, and we want you to, the, the audience to understand that most of the gaps are as large as the first one we're going to show, okay? But some of them aren't that large, so we want to be fair, and we'll yes. show one that's not quite that obvious. The audience will notice that according to Roma, now Alfred Roma wrote the basic vertebrate paleontology book that has been used and used and used. It was the one I used at the university when I studied vertebrate paleontology. All right, he's going to use Alfred Romer as a source. Now, I'm assuming when he says he's going to use Alfred Romer as a source that he's going to be using, um, you know, materials that Romer founded but have been updated by more current biologists, you know, because well, Romer died in, what, 1973? Um, and really his last major updates to any of his books were in the mid to early 60s so you know his information may be a little bit out of date but I, I, I'm positive Floyd Jones wouldn't wouldn't sink so low as to actually use you know 40 50 year old information to support his claim um, I just so happen to have a good collection of Romer's books so I can look up the information at the very least um, what he's used and I will provide uh, updated information in case he, there is some material that may be potentially out of date the first one I'd like for the audience to see is Saltipasuchus. Now, there's a, a, a big mouthful for you. That's a $25 That's word. That's a $25 word. Saltipasuchus was a, something we called a thecodont, and I'm not going to bother with, with that. It had to do with the ruling reptiles, and this is where they began down at the bottom, okay? And he was about four feet long, and supposedly we found him back in the Triassic about uh, 220 million years ago. All right, before I get too far into uh, his analysis here, I want to I want to sort of set the rules by which I'm going to be looking at the remainder of this video. Um, it seems fair to me that since I'm assuming that Floyd Jones is no longer a research paleontologist, uh, he's not in the loop necessarily, that it would be really unfair to hold him to the standards, you know, for example, this video was recorded in 2008, so to hold them to, you know, what happened in 2008, you know, as, as in what was currently known at that time. Um, and so to be fair, I'm going to hold him accountable for basically a decade's worth of material or less, if that makes sense, or more. Yeah, whatever, however I'm thinking it. Um, essentially, since this video was made in 2008, Anything published, anything published prior to 1998, he's accountable for. Anything published between 1998 and 2008 when this video was made, I'm going to assume he maybe he hasn't seen it or he hadn't kept current up. So he's got a 10-year window in which to, to catch up with modern paleontology. Um, so that being said, uh, he mentions the thecodont, the thecodonts, um, Saltopasuchus as a thecodont. Um, now... I don't know, I know that that was suggested, I don't know when it became uh, widely accepted, but I know that there's a 1986 paper, which is significantly older, that was, that suggested that the thecodonts were not 
a natural group, meaning the Thekodont had no taxonomic meaning. They simply was a generic term for any uh, bipedal early archosaur or cruotars crocodilia form. Essentially, any 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 one of the, the the lineage that led to crocodiles and dinosaurs. Um, several times along that lineage, several independent groups developed, you know, the bipedal sort of that theropod type appearance, and those were are collectively known as thecodonts. Um, they used to be thought as as an actual group, as and they were all related to each other. Um, but examination of their ankle joints showed that they were very un widely a number of forms arrived at the same sort of solution to the problem. So. Um, because I don't know when it was, when that term became established as, you know, when thecodonts became so, sort of no longer a, a meaningful term, I don't know when that was. I'm not going to hold it against him that he called uh, Saltopasuchus a thecodont. However, we'll see where he goes from here. And as the audience needs to know that, Floyd, as you used 220 million years ago, those are simply assigned ages. Right. There is no evidence that any of the rocks are considerably older than any of the other rocks. But those Correct. are the ages we want the audience to know. We understand the that concept. That evolution is yes. to it. Correct, Carl. Seriously, you're going to say there's no, uh, we have no way of telling whether or not one rock is any older than any other rock. So when we go out and find rock layers, we find dinosaur layers, and below them we find layers with mammals and trilobite. It's just all this big jumble mixed up thing. No, absolutely no worldwide pattern um, it's, it's that could establish relative dates on any of these fossil layers. Right? Is that what you're, is that what you're going to say? Uh, this, all, of course, radiometric dating to, to establish uh, really, really firm dates on these things. Oh, even though it's been demonstrated, it's, it, it's cross-tested by multiple different methods, all arriving at the exact same conclusions. You creationists like to pretend that it has no validity, that we're just making up dates, pulling them, out of our, pulling them out of our asses. At least you're trying to convince your absolutely ignorant audiences of that's what's going on. Um, or you pretend that they were getting these dates correctly, but the fact that, oh, I don't know, things like fundamental constants of physics change repeatedly throughout the universe. But this, this creature is supposed to be the ancestor uh, of dinosaurs, birds, reptiles, and pterosaurs. Mm -hmm. Now... This is where, if I had a copy of it, I would insert the uh, the uh, you know the the picture of uh, Picard and Riker double face palming. So Saltopasuchus is supposed to be ancestral to turtles and lizards and snakes and dinosaurs and all of that. Really, you know what? I don't have time to get into it in this section. I'm gonna run out. This that's gonna take a. It's gonna take well, a reptile phylogeny lesson, um, and I don't have time to finish it up here. So I will take it up in part four.